Joining us now is a man who probably has the inside scoop on how Dan Quinn ended up being with the Commanders, how McDonald ended up being with Seattle, because last time he joined us, he actually said, like, uh, a lot of people are saying Ben Johnson or Slowick are going to the Commanders and Dan Quinn's going to Seattle. I would bet that one, if not both of those, is wrong. Now, if he knew something he chose not to tell us, Correct. Of what's course. the deal? Ladies mm -hmm. and gentlemen, senior NFL insider for ESPN, Adam Schefter. Boy, Shefty. Shefty. Shefty, we got gentlemen, what's going on? We got Coach Sharon Moore on in the second hour. Obviously, the new man in charge of Michigan. We can't wait to chat with him. We will certainly mention you and all the other prestigious alumni who are excited about where Michigan football is. But let's talk about Dan Quinn to the commanders. We see that, you know, Ben Johnson was supposed to go there. Sloak was supposed to go there. Is there another hiring happening right now? Was that was that him actually texting you in the middle of this entire thing Ooh. we heard that there was supposed to be offensive guy potentially going to the commanders maybe a younger guy going to the commanders now defensive veteran coach hired by the commanders Braves Belichick defensive veteran coaches still on the market will not have a head coaching this kind of coach at carousel why was Dan Quinn the guy over there and how many people knew that that was probably likely well, there are a few things to consider here. I think first and foremost, they had the GM that they wanted. They got the guy that they wanted right away in uh, Adam Peters, and they hired him out of the box. That was something that was important to them, and they got that done. And I think that they were of the mind that in a perfect world, they weren't going to be pairing a first-time GM with a first-time head coach. And so Dan Quinn checks the boxes there in that regard. The other thing is, is that when these organizations are going through this hiring process, they make a lot of calls and they get a lot of calls from a lot of different people, uh, endorsing candidates, recommending guys, you got to get to know this guy, I'm telling you about this guy, vouching for this guy. I, I know that the commanders felt like they got more calls and more texts unsolicited uh, about Dan Quinn with positive messages from people than they got from any other candidate. And that's just the way that it kind of went. Now, that's not why he got the job, but it certainly was comforting and reassuring that they felt like they were getting a guy that is high energy, that's upbeat, that's positive. It probably doesn't hurt that you're weakening the team in the division, although I don't really believe that to be a driving force and a primary factor in why they hired Dan Quinn. They hired Dan Quinn because they believe in him as a leader. They believe in him as a man. They believe that other people are spot on in what they say about Dan Quinn, who had been a finalist for other head coaching jobs, and the board just didn't fall his way in recent years. But they feel like they've got a whole energetic, upbeat, positive guy stepping in to Washington to help try to lead that team into the future. Before we go to Seattle and the Mike McDonald hire, 36-year-old, good, good for him, good for the future of football, when new ownership happens, are you just automatically on the first flight there trying to get in with them so you can get information, <laughs> or how does that whole process go? Legit, that's a real question there. How, how does that go? Because <laughs> there might be some more new ownership, and it's like, obviously, with the Washington football team, the commanders... There's going to be a lot of movements, obviously GM, head coach. They're in D.C. They have a loyal fan base. It's like how quickly do you feel like you get a good sense of what's going on in one of those places? Uh, I mean, that's sort of the job. It's not like uh, Josh Harris and I are having regular phone conversations or anything like that. But uh, yeah, everybody's different. Some people uh, want to talk to the media. Some people don't. Some people have other people speak with the media. It just every situation is different, Pat. And I, I had the uh, fortune of getting to sit down with Josh shortly after he was approved in Minneapolis last summer, got to meet and talk with him. But, uh, you know, it's funny, last year, I was thinking about this last night, I went to a luncheon at the Super Bowl last year on the Friday before the Super Bowl, and I was seated next to Josh Harris at the lunch, and he hadn't even bought the team yet. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit, not a lot, but he and I sat together at this lunch, um, and, uh, Probably didn't spend as much time with him as I should have, but we but we did eat next to each other, and he was I could say I could report back he was very politely mannered and he kept his mouth closed when he chewed his food. That's okay, a big that's deal. Huge. Very happy to hear that, obviously, because <laughs> we've seen him do some interviews in the past. Doesn't feel like he's the most comfortable person speaking, but obviously a mastermind in the things that he does. Feels like he got the guy that he likes. I like that the Bumpus Hounds over there are yeah. also pumped. Uh, it sounds like for the hot. Yeah. I can shut the door in my office. I don't know what the hell's going on, but we got something going on here. Hey, some delivery I would assume coming uh, to the Schefter house. Let's talk about a delivery to Seattle. 
Seattle, Mike McDonald, 36-year-old head coach now, youngest head coach in the NFL, will be leading the Seattle Seahawks. I believe Schneider will be the one in charge there, leading the way with the way it has been reconstructed and who's in the power there. Uh, Chuck Pagano here has obviously been around a long time. He said as soon as he heard about McDonald flying over to Seattle after the Ravens end up losing, it was almost as if the writing was on the wall. We all thought Dan Quinn was going to be that guy. You thought no. When did the McDonald kind of sights start happening for the Seattle Seahawks in your eyes? Well, I think you heard over the weekend, I started to hear that the Seahawks, led by their general manager, John Schneider, were willing to wait to talk to Mike McDonald until after the Ravens season ended, meaning that if the Baltimore Ravens had won in the division or the conference championship round on Sunday against Kansas City, I, I think that they might have extended their search to after the Super Bowl because that's how much they wanted to talk to, meet with, and were interested in Mike McDonald. And so they met with him the day after the game. They fly him out the next day. They wasted no time. Washington also had a certain level of interest in Mike McDonald, who was, by the way, a finalist in Tennessee, in Carolina, people in Atlanta were highly impressed. With it. Like the interesting thing is, when you talk to these teams about these candidates, they really all loved Mike McDonald. He stood out to them, and so it wasn't. You know, when I said to you on Monday that I don't think the board is going to go the way that people are saying, because everybody was saying Ben Johnson in Washington and Dan Quinn in Seattle, and in my mind. I truly believed from what I knew that Mike McDonald was getting one of these jobs. I didn't know which one. Why didn't you I, tell us? I, Come on. Why didn't you tell us? That's the purpose. I, I did tell you. I did tell you. You didn't, you didn't say, I well, Mike McDonald's going to get one of these jobs. I, I, well, I said to you, everybody's expecting Dan <laughs> Quinn in Seattle <clears throat> and Ben Johnson. Yeah, I'm tired of having to least... read through the shit. Just, you know, I, I'm a basic human. Just tell me <laughs> what you know, Shefty. Like, for instance, Pat, what, what do you? You're a very smart guy. You can add one. And I told you that at least one, and maybe both. Those are the exact words. Yeah, see, I use were not going to happen. The internet gods are telling you that you were wrong there. They're throttling <laughs> you mid yell. Your face was frozen there. But now that we yeah. have these two decided, and there's no other head coaching gigs open, it's like Vrabes, Belichick, Ben Johnson, Slowick. We're all just assuming they're going to wait until next year? This is just a next year type thing? Or what do you think happens with Rabes and Bill? Well, they're going to have to sit down and decide exactly how they want to approach the season. And everybody handles it differently. Uh, there are various ways to go about it. Both men are under contract, so it's not like there's any rush. Both men are well-known and have great reputations. People know that they're out there. Uh, I think what if it were me, I think you want to stay involved in the game to some extent. You want to go around in training camps. You want to visit with some organizations that you know and respect with people that will let you kind of watch and observe for three, four, five days at a time, maybe a week. Then maybe you want to work with one of those teams just as a consultant, an advisory role, breaking down film, making suggestions, whatever it may be. Because when the next cycle rolls around, and even before then, frankly, the names that are going to be on the tip of everybody's lips will be Bill Belichick, Mike Vrabel, P. Carroll. And by the way, anytime any of these franchises under high scrutiny with a lot of pressure it go under some kind of losing streak, oh, yeah. wh what's the first thing their fan bases are going to say? What, what, what are you going to be talking about on this show we when a coach starts We could have hired three? Bill Belichick last year. We could have hired yep. Bill Be That's the name. That's gonna Now, Pete Carroll, obviously, legend. Vrabes, legend. But you already got... I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you're around a lot more than me. I had a Jets fan call me this morning, FaceTime me, and go, mm -hmm. what are we doing? We're still mm -hmm. just going to go into this year and we're just going to let Bill Belichick and Vrabes just be... Nothing, mm -hmm. and we're just going to roll with our guy. Now, I'm not saying you, you, know, you know what you know. You know what may happen. What may happen next year? And I just thought of this. This is interesting. Oh, because these guys are out there. I'm just telling you, this is one option. We've seen in the past. This year, it seemed like there were the three openings, and everybody else waited till the end of the season. And then after, because Arthur Smith was fired on Sunday. Ron Rivera fired on Monday. Mike Vrabel was fired on Tuesday. Pete Carroll was Wednesday. Bill Belichick was Thursday. It was one a day. What you may see next year is this could impact how teams handle their coaching situations so that in, I'm making this up, November 1st, when a team is 3-6, and 3-7, and seven, 
and they've fallen out and the owner knows he's making a change. At that point in time, you pull the plug mid-November so that you could get out there to start interviewing candidates so that you can get a jump on Mike Vrabel, Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll, whoever it is that you want to go hire. If you remember, I believe that Mike Shanahan was hired by Washington in season. Before the season was over, they announced it, if my memory serves me correct, in December. And that may be the type of thing that we face the prospect of seeing this upcoming season where coaches are let go in early to mid-November as opposed to a team waiting around to the end of the season. Hey, we appreciate the hell out of you, buddy. Good luck with everything. Host of the Adam Schefter Podcast, senior NFL insider at ESPN. And a man who got it right, I guess, didn't really give it all. Right. No. <laughs> who got it right. Ladies and gentlemen, Adam Schefter. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Chuck, let's talk about that. Like yeah. a mid-season potential opportunity. And obviously we bring up the Jets because of the amount of scrutiny that was on it. And they decided to run it back from last year and all the dreams and hopes that they had last year. They're just going to hope that the same exact thing happens this year. And if it doesn't work out, their fans are going to get loud. Not that their fans haven't been loud, but it's going to get – they're not the only team, though, that potentially starts bad. And the fans knew it was maybe going to be a bad year. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but – there's a lot of places with Bill out there and Pete out there and Vrabes out there. And I think Carolina did this whenever Tepper took over the team with Ron Rivera, like fired him like week six or seven mm -hmm. or yeah. something. And they're like, hey, we're going to get a jump on next yeah. year. We're going to try to do that whole thing. What does that mean for the coaches you think that are currently in those positions? Like Robert Sala knows. Like Bill Belichick's out there. Eberflus knows. Like, hey, Vrabes is still out there and our fans are potentially feeling that way. How do they keep that out? And what is the perspective you think they have yeah, to Yeah, you can't worry about that. We all know, you hear that cliche all the time, right? We know what we signed up for. They obviously know that they have to win. You know, it's bottom line business. You win, you get to keep your job. Uh, if you don't, you're out. So they know those guys are out there. My question is, look at the average age of the guys hired this year, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody's going young. So Bill's going to be out a year. Pete's going to be out a year. Mm -hmm. And now they're going to be 73. And, and yeah. you know, Bill turns 72 in April, I believe. Yep. You know, he'll be – so – Guys, ownership, GM, they're going to say, are we going to go hire a 72, 73-year-old, and how long is he going to want to coach for? So the average age, to me, is like that's the biggest thing, you know, biggest question mark. And then they're not going to be a fit for maybe one, one or, you know. So I thought potentially the commanders were a fit for Bill Belichick, just strictly because – all the people that would potentially get fired when Bill Belichick came in, which was a conversation piece, I guess, around the Atlanta Falcons. It's like, hey, when Bill comes in, he's taken over a lot of different jobs and he has his people that are in there. It's a two to three year run. Do we want to fire 30 people that we have hired and we know for a two to three year no, run sir. with Bill Belichick? That's a lot of extra mm -hmm. bullshit that comes mm -hmm. alongside of hiring a coach. And obviously that comes with part of the job. You're making billions of dollars. There's a reason for that. It's not every day is going to be easy, especially if you want change. But that is certainly cause for concern for an owner, especially older owners, you know? People are talking about that with the Cowboys. Like, you think Jerry Jones at his age wants to go through an entire new reset of his organization and culture? Nobody's really talking about that. The commanders, they're, they're already having the reset. Yeah. So, like, if you want to steal a two- to three-year window here to kind of launch your new legacy, your new ownership, that might be the spot where Bill Belichick comes in and is like, I got the... GM area. Mm -hmm. I got like the scouting that we want. I got the head coaching. I know I got the people here for this. It's almost like a plug in place of a system, but them choosing to go a different direction. Still the oldest coach that was hired outside of Harbaugh this hiring cycle was Dan Quinn in his 50s or whatever. It's just like, I don't know who's going to hire 15 wins away. Yes. Bill Belichick. It's right there. 15 wins it's away from being the all time winningest coach in the history of the NFL. And what you just pointed out, and what we've kind of talked about, it's like, it's it's seemingly not, it's not going to happen for Bill, well, which is bananas to think about at this age. Yeah, definitely not this year, but like all the two to three year run stuff we're talking about with the, you know, Belichick, and th that makes the most sense with the Jets. And I hate that I'm saying it, but like, if Rodgers is their plan and that's a two to three year run, why wouldn't you partner your two to three year run quarterback hmm. with a two to three year, year run with the greatest coach and GM of all time? Like that's a match made in heaven, it feels like. And like even if the Jets sneak into the playoffs at nine and eight or ten and seven and then they don't, you know, go to the conference championship, it feels like even that would be grounds for them to say, all right, solid Douglas, like we did what we could in these two years with Rodgers. Obviously, we only got one real year with him, but even that year 
didn't look great. Let's try the two to three year run with the two to three years left we have with Rodgers with Bill Belichick. And if we win it in that span, awesome. If we don't, well, Rodgers, we're going to have to reset again. Yeah, Rodgers is gone anyway. So we have to start this thing over either way. 